Good afternoon and welcome to the Preservation Association Lincoln Brown Bag Lecture Series. My name is Eileen Burke and I'm the coordinator of these brown bags. The videotaping today is sponsored by the Historic Preservation Fund of the U.S. Department of Interior through the Nebraska State Historical Society and the City of Lincoln, a certified local government. Our speaker today is Ed Zimmer. Ed was the Historic Preservation Planner in the city uh, Lincoln City and County Government from 85 to 2020. Since returning, Ed remains in, since retiring, Ed remains an active community historian and volunteer. He recently has finished two books, the third and final volume of the Near South Walking Tour books and a book on Lincoln Postcards with Jim McKee. Ed is native to Omaha and has an undergraduate degree from Lindenwood College and a PhD from Boston University. Ed's talk today is the seven old mains of Lincoln and the environs. Please join me in welcoming Ed Zimmer. I didn't warn Eileen, but I decided that there are eight old mains and so I just took the number off, off the title card. And Old Mains is kind of a term of art. I thought maybe I could just switch the whole talk and do something about old lions at the zoo. Um, but then, it, then I would have spelled it wrong. So these, these will be the old lions uh, because the approach I want to take starts with the University of Nebraska. And the University of Nebraska in a sense, starts with the layout of the city of Lincoln. And these were the three constitutional officers, the governor, Butler, Secretary of State Kennard, and State Auditor Gillespie, who were tasked with finding a place for the capital city of the new state of Nebraska uh, as the capital commission. And they visited the little town of Lancaster that had about 30 occupants and selected it and started to form the city through the device of this plat, this, uh, or this portrait of a waffle. Uh, a Street on the south, O up near the top, first on the west, 17th on the east, and then a smaller square that went up north of O Street, and in the, about the middle of that was this four block, super block, marked University Place. We'll get to University Place, the city, but this was University Place, the campus. And so they designated on the original 1867 plan of the city um, a campus site of about 12 acres, um, 10th to 12th Street, R to T Streets. Um, and set that aside. There was no, yet no University of Nebraska. Uh, the legislature was busily assigning it to what, a dozen plus locations in the first couple years of Nebraska's history. And then finally in 1869, charter what we know as the University of Nebraska. Um, and it goes to this location that had been set aside two years before. I color up the original plat um, because there were three super blocks in that plan uh, of the same, all of the same size. The university, big red square at the top, the um, Camp, the Capitol site itself of Capitol Square or State House Square and down towards the southwest part of town, um, marked in green here, a park that becomes eventually Cooper Park. But those were the three super blocks within the plan. And then in the notes up on the legend on the upper right, it was indicated that streets would be 100, or street rights of way in Lincoln would be 100 feet, more than ample, but certain special streets would be 120 feet of right of way, and those were O and N, or O and 9th, the commercial blocks marked in orange for the little commercial lots along them. Um, and then those key streets that would provide vistas to the Capitol, J and 15th, or what we might call um, Goodhue, Centennial Mall, Lincoln Mall, um, and 11th leading right up to the center of the campus um, if we look at this modern, or more modern at least, aerial view, there's the campus, the original campus portion of a much larger um, city campus today. The Capitol Square, 
hard to envision, but that's the same size as the original campus and the park um, up between 8th and 6th, <coughs> south of F down to D. So those were those three super blocks in the original plan. And on the campus block, um, beginning in the early 1870s, a old main, never called that, it's called the University Hall, uh, typically, but an old main type building, all of the facilities in that single building, classrooms, offices, chapel, library, um, all there in one building. And this was designed by an architect named Matthew McBird um, from Indiana. He kind of came in a package deal with a contractor named Silver, um, also from Logansport, Indiana. I think they were hired together to put up this great big building. Looking back to what um, McBird had done previously, he had built some county courthouses in Indiana. Um, and here's one of them. And, but this, this isn't nearly as big as the campus building. And they also faced the obstacle as they came to Lincoln that they were being hired from several states away because there weren't yet architects or major builders in the little town of, of Lincoln. Um, there also weren't building materials. So they're baking their bricks right on site and they're building a foundation of that wonderful, nice workable stone that sits under our, our city, Dakota Sandstone. That's also what Robber's Cave is carved out of and people could carve in the walls of Robber's Cave with a spoon. Uh, so they were building a foundation on, mm, it was probably as much sand as it was stone, virtually. Um, this view, um, if I jumped up to, no, this, this, is, this is the lovely view um, that Matt Hansen has provided. Looks like it's about mid-1870s. And notice the dark brown foundation stone, but in one corner, this is Mr. Silver who's putting the building together. Down in this corner, you see a light-colored portion of the foundation. They're starting already to replace the Dakota sandstone with limestone in the very first years of the, cap of the University Hall's existence. One of the figures involved in that project was this man, Artemis Roberts, probably the first resident architect in Lincoln, arrives in the early 1870s. In his memoir, he recalls he's hired to go in and do some of that repair work on the brand new University Hall, or even as it's being built. And he says, one night they go in and a beam is broken. It looks like the building's gonna fall down around them and they have to shore it up in the dark. Uh, I believe this Quaker abolitionist or Quaker prohibitionist um, of, said he had to get his workmen drunk to get them to go into this uh, hazardous basement setting and prop up the building before it fell around them. Um, Robert stays on in Lincoln to the early um, 20th, 20th, yes, 20th century. Uh, he builds Fairview for William Jennings Bryan. Um, and then at about 60 years old, he retires to Florida where he practices for four more decades um, till 1944, dies at 103 years old. But this view gives us Artemis Roberts much closer to the age when he's um, practicing in Lincoln. It's a, an image of the 1880s. Silver uh, is probably not particularly remembered, but if he were to be remembered, it would be because he was the third and the sixth mayor of Lincoln. Um, terms were two years at that time, um, and he was elected in 1873 for two years, and then again in 1876, there was a gap between. So he's the third and sixth mayor of Lincoln, and he's, uh, his portrait's in the gallery of Lincoln mayors. Uh, it must not have stuck too much that his building started falling down almost as soon as he built it. Um, we also see on that early view um, a bell not up in the tower, so that's not exactly a belfry. The bell sat on the front gable um, on a little platform. And that bell is still among us um, out in the Wick Alumni Garden, uh, the corner of 16th and R. Uh, that's still the bell from up on um, University or yeah, University Hall. This is a 
Um, eight, a couple decades later, now all the foundations have been replaced and the building looks a little more stable. Um, the campus looks like it's been planted in native prairie at this time, very advanced, ecologically sound. Um, it probably just was native prairie at this moment. Uh, this is uh, from the 1889 uh, beautiful picture book, Lincoln Picturesque and Descriptive. And we see we've started building some more campus buildings by this time, but they're not old mains, so I don't have to deal with them all. That's a different talk. And it's better if Jim McKee does that talk than if I do. Or Kay Logan Peters can do that talk too. Um, but this is um, University Hall about 1888-1889. And there it sits on that 11th Street view, right up in the center. But you have to think today of looking up 13th to Love Library. That's much the same effect um, as was built into the plan um, in 1867 for a view up to the heart of the university, up 11th Street. Today, 11th Street looks a little different, and we don't quite see the heart of the university um, looking up 11th. This would be all the way down at um, G Street, I think. But if we get up a little closer, you do see at the head of 11th Street the Diamond Vision screen on the north end of the stadium. So you do know there's, there's at least a big red N up there to tell you that's campus. In the, I think the current campus plan will build um, a kind of a vantage point at the head of 11th Street, sort of behind um, the lead center. So it won't just be the lead loading dock forever um, in that view. University Hall became the centerpiece of many postcards through the early 20th century. Here we've um, gotten up to the point that the fence has been established around the campus in the 1890s. And a view through one of the gates, the original gates in that fence. The fence now, of course, is the O Street face of Wayuka Cemetery. This building started coming down um, by the 1920s. Uh, the roof and the tower were taken off, and it was an ugly stub of the old building, uh, but lasted that way a couple more decades, and here it's being finally torn down in 1948. So that's our first of the old mains, and it stands alone for about two decades. And then there's an explosion of old mains, and we build all the rest of them in about a five or six year period, late 1880s, early 1890s. 1880s was a boom decade in Lincoln. The population quadrupled from about 13,000 to 55,000 in the decade of the 1880s. Um, and into the early 1890s, it's still a city that looks like it's going to become one of the major cities in America if you just mapped that, that growth till 1893. And that nationwide panic of 1893 um, kind of knocks the pins out from under the boom town on the prairie. Population actually drops in that decade, and these new colleges that I'm going to show you all are facing this tremendous economic downturn just in their first decade. First of those was Nebraska Wesleyan um, up in the northeast part of town. It establishes the pattern that we'll see for several of these towns uh, it was formed around the Methodist College that grew out of the Methodist conferences of Nebraska, deciding in 1886 that they really can't support three separate institutions of higher learning scattered around the state. Uh, there was already one in York, another in Central City, and the one that I'm sure you all are familiar with in Barkley, Nebraska, Bartley, Nebraska, um, and all have just started, and they all want to be um, permanent institutions. The conferences get together and say we can't support all of those. Maybe they can be feeder schools or prep schools, but we'll have to put together a new university in one of the larger cities. York wants to be that larger city. Um, other cities compete to put together a package of incentives, but Lincoln puts together the one that wins, um, platting a town to be called University Place with a 44-acre campus in the middle of it that will be gifted to the new Methodist College. And some of the house lots in the surrounding blocks also part of the package so they can sell those to finance um, as part of the costs of construction. The building that is um, 
form to begin that university uh, is the only one that I think carried and still carries today the name of Old Main. Uh, and it's designed by Gibbs and Parker. Um, it's a National Register listed building and the National Register nomination says Gibbs and Parker of Kansas City, um, leading architects who've done lots of major buildings in Ohio and elsewhere. As far as I can tell, Gibbs and Parker were a partnership the year they built this. Um, Gibbs never lived in Kansas City. Parker did for that one year. They were both from Toledo, Ohio, um, and they, they were starting to establish uh, a firm in Kansas City that did not last there. And as far as I can tell, Parker didn't do a whole lot. Gibbs was a pretty uh, significant figure. Parker does not seem to be, at least what I can find so far. Uh, but they designed this very fine, high Richardson Romanesque uh, old main um, to begin Nebraska Wesleyan. Uh, they're building it by 1887, and I think it's about 1889 that they're mostly established. The town is incorporated in 1889. Gibbs is mo much more researchable than Parker, um, partly because he's credited as the first mayor of Oklahoma City. That is, for 25 days, of leading the commission that was tasked by the territorial legislature of Oklahoma with getting Oklahoma City founded. And so he is the leader of the commission that starts to establish the city from <coughs> July to August of 1890. And then he, he lives for another two decades in Oklahoma City, but his mayoral term is 25 days long uh, in, in 1890. But while he's building, but it does get us his portrait from the library system of Oklahoma City, so that's, that's good enough. Um, but while he's, before he had built Nebraska Wesleyan, he had done some major courthouses um, in Ohio and in Michigan. Um, this one, I think, is in Marion, Ohio. Uh, so he's, he's experienced in major buildings. Um, and they produce a major building at Nebraska Wesleyan, um, this fine red brick and Colorado redstone um, old main building that then is featured, of course, as it should be uh, in the postcards uh, and still stands today with a little bit of loss there in the forehead uh, where the clock tower has been taken down and turned into um, kind of a giant ventilator and a blank wall. Maybe they at least ought to do a poster or a banner or something up there, a digital clock projected uh, from across the street. Uh, but a fine building, still in use, and still retaining uh, the high finishes of uh, decorative brick and some of this wonderful molded brick uh, forming those kind of colonnettes and then the um, very handsome low archway of the Richardson Romanesque in Colorado Redstone. Just a very lovely building. This is Gibbs' other project while he's building Nebraska Wesleyan and it's the territorial capital of Wyoming. So he's a busy fellow and doing some major, major work. It's the, it's the a nucleus of the state capital of Wyoming. Additional wings are put on it uh, not long after, but this is Gibbs's portion um, of right about 1887 while Nebraska Wesleyan is also being built um, off in the Wyoming territory. So we've got two but to go on to three, we'll move down to the uh, southeast part of Lincoln, where another college town and another denominational college are going to be established. And it's these first two, actually all three of these, that still give us today uh, higher education establishments um, in the expanded city of Lincoln. But down in the southeast part of town, right about 1890, the Adventist Church has decided it's going to establish not just a Nebraska uh, college, but a unified college for the whole central region of the country. Uh, they're building Adventist colleges in Michigan and in Washington and in California, um, but in Nebraska serving a number of conferences, they're going to establish a union college. Uh, and they build it down in the new town of um, College View. It's a smaller plat and a smaller campus, um, but a very ambitious building program. You can see on this 192 map, little 
um, marks for three buildings sitting in the center of this campus. They were all designed by this man, William Conquer Sisley, one of the best names of a Lincoln architect ever. Um, and I like to think of him as William the Conqueror Sesley, <laughs> which I think is probably what his mother and father thought of him. He was English born, um, comes as a teenager to Michigan and is in the Adventist church and really practices then worldwide on Adventist projects. Uh, this was a very young Sisley, um, about the time he was working on a new Adventist college in California. Um, then he comes up to Lincoln um, about 1890, and this is the, the early design for the old main at Union College, uh, which is not only built in 1890-91, but the adjacent women's dorm, or ladies' dorm as they called it, and the men's dorm were also established, all in that first building campaign. There was the ladies' dorm to the south, so this would be near what we would call 48th and Prescott. Um, I think they called it Union and College um, in their old street system. And the men's dorm, which was to the north, they overbuilt to the point that they couldn't operate all of these buildings in their early decades, and they leased out uh, the north building as a sanitarium uh, for almost a couple decades and then have to negotiate as they grow, getting it back as the men's dorm. Those buildings are gone, but still across the street from campus, this beautiful little house, sometimes called the Century House or the Eno House, or today called Sisley Inn, appropriately for the architect. This was the, the house that Sisley um, set aside for testing the contractors and carpenters who would build his campus buildings. So if you wanted to get hired to build the great big one, you had to come do good work on this beautiful little um, Queen Anne house that still stands. Um, in the earliest listings in the Lincoln papers about the new town that's being established, they list that several, something like three dozen buildings were already going up. That was in the whole town, not on the campus. And that four major houses were being built, including W.C. Sisley's house, and I think that was this one um, in its beginnings. There's a few other early, early houses scattered around university, around College View, that Sisley probably also had a hand in in his first couple years. Um, he then moves on from Lincoln to Washington State, where he builds, um, he designs Walla Walla um, College uh, for the Adventists, on down to Texas, where he designs the sanitarium. Um, over to Denmark, where he designs sanitarium, to Germany, where he, he designs a um, publishing house, South Africa, and this is all about a one and a half or two year tour, South Africa, where he designs an academy, and then on to Australia, where there is an Adventist col colony or co um, and establishes a college there. And then he's back to Battle Creek, Michigan, um, here he is with his wife and three daughters, um, and he runs the publishing operation for the Adventists for about five years in Battle Creek, and gets, I would think, promoted to run the British um, publishing operation for the Adventists, and he's in London for, um, I think it then puts him there about 10 years before he retires about 1910, and comes back um, to Tennessee to live near his oldest daughter and her family, um, and that's where he and his wife were buried. Um, so we've now established Union College, and between Nebraska Wesleyan and Union, we have to insert two more colleges. Uh, first of all, up just adjacent on the neighboring settlement to University Place, um, the town of Bethany Heights. And Bethany, while it sort of follows the University Place, and college view pattern, the real estate developers get out ahead of the college builders. And they assemble some land, quite a, quite a sizable piece of land, set aside a portion they're willing to give up for a college and they go searching for a church to build it. Uh, the Baptists turn them down, but the Church of Christ say, yeah, we're ready to build a college and they accept uh, the package deal and start to build Nebraska Christian University uh, in the, the new town of Bethany Heights. This is a little bit later because we weren't flying around taking 
uh, aerial views in the 1890s. Um, but it doesn't look too different from Bethany later. It doesn't get as densely built up as certainly University Place or even College View do. But we see that big campus um, near the center in the upper right with one major building on it, a uh, smaller one behind it, a dormitory back across what we would call Lexington behind that. This is the building under construction. Um, I think it's about, um, I've, I've dropped my page of notes to get all of my dates right. Uh, this early 1890s, it's under construction, and this is supposed to be the dedication day photo. They're dedicating it, they're initiating it long before they, they are ready to open. Um, I think it's 1890 um, that they're under construction and finish this gorgeous building, a big clock tower or a big uh, central tower up the middle, kind of Flemish gable ornaments on the peaks. Um, designed by Lincoln architect Otis H. Placey. Um, Placey gives us one building to kind of remember him by in town if you squint a little because Placey designs for Central Christian Church on the corner of 14th and K, a church in the late 1880s that looks like St. Mary's on that corner. And the tower is St. Mary's, but ignore the roof lines because St. Mary's lost, um, or Central Christian was lost to the mortgage holders in the 1890s. Um, and then as the Catholics bought it to install and remodel it as their cathedral, um, unfortunately, they lit it on fire about 1906 and burned down the roofs, the interior, but not the corner tower. So the corner tower uh, with an 1888 cornerstone on it um, is Placey's work and it really establishes the presence of that beautiful church on the corner campus. Matt. That construction photo you showed was in Lincoln Picturesque, so it's 88-89. Then this wonderful postcard, I was visiting back to County City Building just, just a couple weeks ago pick up some detail for some research I was doing and a fellow, um, Sean Stewart from uh, Public Works, now called uh, LTU, Lincoln uh, Transportation and Utilities, said, Ed, Ed, I, I've got something for you on my desk. And he had this wonderful trifold postcard of the Cotner College campus with the college building, the whole faculty and student body arrayed there on the campus. That street we would see on the far right edge would be what we'd call Cottoner Boulevard. Um, it's a trifold, but literally was a postcard. You'd fold it up, tape it shut, and you could put it, you could mail it for a, a penny. Um, but there's the building um, with another uh, a postcard, another postcard view of, of a graduating class. And then off in the background, looking closely at what the, what the trifold shows us, we see Union College all the way down at College View. And on the right edge, kind of that ghostly figure is the Christian church, the campus church right across the street uh, from the campus. Unfortunately, this um, Woods and Cordner building burned down in the late 20s, but it's replaced by Handsome Davis and Wilson Bethany Christian Church on the same site. So we don't have this building, but there is a handsome Gothic Revival church there. We've lost all of evidence of Cottoner College except for um, a little bit north of the, the campus. Um, this house uh, built about the, at the beginning of the college, about 1890, um, for Professor Beatty. James Beatty was one of the founding professors of what immediate, what almost immediately was renamed Cottoner College. At the end of their first year of operation as a Nebraska Christian, the trustees got a gift from Samuel Cottoner of Omaha. And it was real estate supposedly worth $35,000, but that was a very low valuation, the newspaper optimistically said. Um, and for that, they renamed it Cottoner College. Uh, and that was really at their first commencement that was taking place. Um, Beatty was a professor there, builds this lovely Queen Anne house, and it still stands on Colby, just north of what was the original campus. So this is kind of as close as we get to a Nebraska Christian Cottoner College building. 
That dorm that shows up faintly in the aerial view still stands. Uh, it's an apartment building, doesn't really say much about a college uh, standing there on Lexington. So we had, we had four, now we have five because between Cottoner College and um, Cottoner and Union College, we're going to slip in um, this lovely college building for Nebraska Normal University. Normal in this sense is the normal of Normal Boulevard. It has nothing to do with abnormal. It has to do with a teacher's college. Uh, Peru Normal, Wayne, Wayne Normal, uh, Kearney Normal, it was simply the designation of a teacher's college and that was a primary, not a sole focus, but a primary focus of several of these um, early colleges. I'd long thought, and I think I've put in print somewhere, that Artemis Roberts designed this building, and Matt Hansen kindly shared with me a beautiful newspaper image of perspective that does not say Artemis Roberts, it says Geo George W. Peters, architect, uh, in this lovely rendering. Fortunately, we know a little bit of, of George Peters, and he's left us a little bit of building stock in Lincoln down in the near south neighborhood. Uh, this is the corner, this is Prospect Street at 19th, and James and Marcy Young live in this beautiful house that uh, Peters had built either for his own family or he lived in it while he finished building it, and then sells it to Governor Thayer. So it's typically known as the Governor Thayer House. Um, it's about uh, 1888, 89. Um, and Peters, very young architect, built another house for his own family across the street from this. Um, so there's a couple houses there in that 1900 block of, of prospect um, by Peters. Lincoln Normal advertised heavily. They promoted what a, what a going operation they were. They had a, a, a good early student body. They had these ads about um, if, if you come out and visit our campus and it isn't the highest and best normal college you've ever seen, we will, we will fund your tuition somewhere else. If you come and visit us and you don't like it, we'll pay your car fare. And then on each of these in that little um, kind of zipped box, it says, and no one has ever asked us to make good on this promise because everybody's just so impressed. Um, down on the lower right, uh, the address is given as J.F. Sayers, president. He was transferring in from a normal college in Shenandoah, Iowa, and M.P. Givens, the vice president, was an educator, entrepreneur, real estate wheeler dealer from Denver, and together they buy out the Found, Sayers was there from the beginning, but the founding owners immediately ran into trouble and Givens helped buy them out and they had new ownership within just about their second year um, on the campus. They also advertised for time that they were going to have a military academy portion uh, with a first lieutenant uh, helping um, operate that. Um, you don't see much of that campus today, and we'll get to why. But you do see in that neighborhood that we would call the normal neighborhood, and there is a plat for normal heights. It never was incorporated. So there's kind of a neighborhood or a place we could call normal, um, but not one of these true suburban incorporated towns. On 53rd Street, south of South, because this campus sat at the corner of 56th and South, uh, the Southwest corner, um, you see a couple houses of this scale, but more altered but tucked away on um, 51st at Glade is this big house, and it, it is built in the first years of Lincoln Normal uh, for a, a husband and wife um, professor pair, uh, both academics, Charles Shelton, who was the early vice president of the college, and his wife, Julia, who was in charge of the kindergarten department not meaning that she was teaching little children, she was teaching the teachers of little children, and kindergarten was a pretty new concept in the early 1890s, and she's and this college are on the cutting edge of preparing kindergarten teachers. The Sheltons quickly go on back to, Illinois, back to Iowa, where um, Charles becomes president of Simpson College in Indianola. 
they sell the house, though the next buyer is Gibbons, who is coming in from Denver as the vice president of uh, Lincoln Normal. So we take away Shelton's, I don't have Gibbons' portrait, so he doesn't get featured here. This is why we see nothing of that college today. Uh, within just the first few years, 1898, the building burns down, um, just totally destroyed in fire. We see off to the left side another building nearby, and that becomes this, the germ of what grows in the seed of what grows into um, Dr. Bailey's sanatorium or Green Gables, he calls it. He buys the campus site and the remaining dormitory building um, in the first decade of the 20th century and establishes quite a going concern of the sanitarium uh, on that campus. In the 1950s, the Benedictine sisters buy from uh, the estate of Dr. Bailey uh, the campus and the b remaining buildings for Madonna House, which is going to be an elderly elder care facility, and then that evolves and develops and develops into Madonna Rehab Hospital and that world-class facility that is on the old Lincoln Normal campus. None of the buildings survive. Um, ba the last was Bailey's bungalow uh, that sat um, just off South Street on the campus. But that large campus enlarging now beyond and a few houses scattered around it uh, remind us of a college that was there less than a decade on that corner. And back to Peters for a minute because he's going to take us into our next old main, sort of by, um, by reference at least, and that was uh, Lincoln Conservatory of Music. We're back downtown um, at 13th and L, southeast corner. And this huge building uh, was put up by Professor Howells. He comes to Lincoln. He'd been exploring where to put a conservatory of music. Uh, he looked at York pretty closely uh, in 1888, but then he comes up to Lincoln and buys this corner downtown, Kitty Corner from uh, First Congregational Church. Um, and brings his brother from Michigan to build a conservatory of music, working with um, an architect from York um, named Sherman, and they design um, to the specs of Professor Howells this all-in-one conservatory of music. Dorms, a 500-seat auditorium, a restaurant in the building, not just a cafeteria, but a restaurant, libraries, practice rooms, all of it in that building. They very soon add, and you can see off to the right, um, an additional wing for more dormitory facilities. And they're cranking out so many teacher, so many music teachers uh, in their program that they fairly quickly go out of business. But early on, they think this is going so well, we can expand into an even bigger conservatory. And Howells buys a parcel directly north across L Street um, and hires um, as the architect um, R. G. George W. Peters to design an even bigger conservatory um, in 1892, which is just before 1893, which means it all goes sour after construction begins. And they're building a stone conservatory there. It's meant to be a five-story building. Howells loses it to his investors and it's sold to others, and they finish the first three stories that were already up as an apartment building. Peters dies about that time. I don't think he wants this one on his resume because um, this isn't what he designed, but the building stood called Waverly Hotel uh, or Waverly Apartments um, on that corner would be directly across the street uh, from the front door of Cornesker Hotel today, um, and it sat there for some decades um, on that corner meant to be the next home of the Conservatory of Music, um, didn't happen. Conservatory closed, I think it was 1907 or 8, and the building was used um, as apartments uh, for several years. It was torn down in the early 1920s. The dorm wing on the south remained as an apartment building for some decades after. I gave this talk last night, and a fellow in attendance, grandparents had lived in the old conservatory in 1919, 
which matched okay with it being torn down in the 20s. So um, now we have our seventh old main. Um, and I have to draw my arrow pointing not in towards the map, but out away from the map, because this one was planted about three and a half miles out of town, out Van Dorn Street, out to West Van Dorn Street, and a location that would today be north of the north entrance to Pioneers Park. So it's sort of the back door to Pioneers Park with the elk bronze in that driveway. Imagine where the men's reformatory is on the north side of uh, West Van Dorn Street, and that's the old campus, or includes the old campus, uh, in what would have been a town called Hawthorne. And there is a plat established with a campus in the middle of it for Hawthorne, uh, and some houses were built there, mostly servicing um, the campus, and a huge um, reform at, or a, a huge normal building called Western Normal that essentially was transplanted from Shenandoah, Iowa. There had been a very going concern there that burned down. There's a pattern of a sort to some of these. Um, and Western Normal decides they won't rebuild in Shenandoah, although they wanted them to. They'll move off to this big going boomtown prairie capital of Lincoln, Nebraska, or at least nearby. And they buy their campus west of town um, and put up this huge uh, normal university. It's going to be, they claim, second largest normal in America. I don't want to try to run them all down and figure out if that was a valid claim or not. In fact, this is advertising, so we'll, we'll recognize it for what it is. Uh, they had streetcar service out here, and you see a little streetcar, um, at least optimistically, shown in front of the college. Uh, William Crowen, or I don't know if it's Crowen or Crone, um, comes the president of Western Normal, um, moves over to establish in Lincoln. Some of the faculty came, some of the student body came over to Lincoln to this new building. It was designed by George Fisher, an Omaha architect, uh, who was in the Mendelssohn Fisher Lowry firm at that time, uh, but he's the name credited with this quite grand design uh, with a huge tall tower. We can connect Fisher to another of our campuses, the oldest uh, building on the uh, University of Nebraska City campus. Uh, we would call Architecture Hall, but was built as the library, um, spanning the period of construction of Western Normal um, was by Mendelssohn Fisher Lowry. So they have two projects going on in Lincoln at this time, and this one um, still thankfully standing, now called Architecture Hall. And if we think about the link that joins Architecture Hall to what's called Old Law, the Old Law College behind. Keep in mind that Old Law was built by Berlinghoff and Davis, and that'll be important to Western Normal before we finish its story. Western Normal only operates uh, from early 1890s to 1895. They fail soon after the crash. Uh, there are a couple other short-term users of the building. And then about 1908, it is purchased by a Colonel Hayward, who is well recognized as an educator of young men in Nebraska. He's popular with the um, Lincoln business community, that they're uh, much in support of him getting that building back in use. And he, he begins to operate it as Nebraska Military Academy, meaning that it's basically a high school prep for university students. So it's a younger age than the normal uh, as it was originally designed. And they open, uh, I think it's in 1908, and operate about a week. Uh, but it's all ready to go. Well, it's opening in 1908. Uh, later in September or early October, it lights on fire. Uh, he thought he had a nice slate roof. It was wood shingle. And one of the chimneys ignites the roof, ignites the building guts out the whole structure. Hayward's well enough recognized, supported in town. He moves the operation into the old convent building at about 15th and U that was going to be a dormitory and never took off as a dormitory and then was a convent for a time. And he operates uh, the military academy there while he rebuilds out on the western site. And George Berlinghoff designs the rebuild 
So we go from this um, academic version to this fort version with crenellation running all along. So they have some walls and they have a tower and they put a building back inside of that, um, but looking more militaristic for the military. Better advertising, I suppose. Um, this postcard view, another, this is just a bifold, but how lovely can it be? I think this is probably another Matt Hansen gift of the scan of this. And this whole line of student cadets, including a little guy on the right-hand side, they said that they could serve children down to 12 years old and had a special um, program for them. It looks like the guy on the, on the far right is probably 12. Or he's me in my sophomore year. That's about <laughs> my size as a high school student arrayed in front of the military academy. This operates then for about a decade. Uh, Hayward dies in 1916 um, and the school closes. It is then, and this was a, really a postcard as well, if you went foreign you had to put two cents on the postcard. It's bought in the early 1920s by the, by the state of Nebraska and they convert it to a men's reformatory. So same building, I think maybe that little um, polygonal building in the foreground is the guard tower at the, at the gate. And that probably was not part of the military academy, but they certainly got it right in the style of Berlinghoff's um, expansions. But it's got a fence, probably barbed wire, around the building, or in a postcard view with, I think, a truckload of guards, or maybe convicts going out to work the, the, the farm or something, um, the penitentiary or reformatory building. This after newer buildings were put on the same campus and still operate there as a reformatory, this building was used for warehousing. Some people remember going out there for au surplus auctions, I think, of federal properties. I don't know if any stones or, stand or bricks are standing on bricks. I don't wander this campus, thankfully. Um, <coughs> but if a couple, within the last couple decades, there were still some remnants of this standing, but not in educational use. And then our final old main, shifting all the way up to the upper left and the northwest corner of town where a section called Grandview had been laid out in the late 1880s. And this was in a progression marching northward from Belmont, just across Salt Creek from Lincoln, up to Lincoln Heights, and then skipping a little piece up to the top of the hill to be called Grandview. And it was laid out with these curving streets, the first place in Lincoln to be designed with curving streets. It didn't really develop that way, so Sheridan can claim kind of the first deviation from the grid in a successful way. But Grandview was established to be a picturesque suburb way up north of town, um, and a campus was assigned within that plat and on it, the Episcopal Church began building in 1890 what they called Trinity Hall, um, and then renamed as they got it finished and opened by 1892, uh, Worthington Military Academy. John H.W. Hawkins, um, builder of many fine buildings in Lincoln, uh, was the architect for the building just about the time he had moved from Lincoln he had overbuilt at 19th and Washington Street, and his house was blanketed with mechanic liens, and he moved to Omaha. But he designed this as his last Lincoln project. Um, he's in Omaha until the crash, and then he goes back to Pennsylvania. And finally, Hawkins finishes his career with very productive years in Florida. Uh, but this big, beautiful building uh, is described as having um, offices, including the headmistress, headmaster's office on the upper stories within a large atrium that reached all the way up into that tower with windows on every side of the tower. Sounds like it was a fabulous building until, and it was an architectural gem, and we know because it said so in the newspaper. Um, and it opens, uh, has a um, rather light attendance by the mid-1890s. Uh, it resembles in a larger fashion um, Hawking's other late work in Lincoln, which was Bonicum Institute, the Catholic high school, built downtown at 13th and M. Um, and this is a lovely drawing um, by one of Hawking's assistants. And that stood 
uh, right next to not St. Mary's as someone misinscribed on the drawing or on the photo, but St. Teresa's. Not St. Teresa's the parish, but St. Teresa's the cathedral downtown, predecessor to St. Mary's downtown. And on the right side, we see um, the Bonnicum Institute, predecessor to Pius X. Um, and so that gives us all of our eight old mains around Lincoln. The newspapers boasted about Lincoln's educational offerings and all of these fabulous buildings. 1892, we get all of them listed there uh, in the newspaper, go from the university to Wesleyan to Cotner, Union, Military Academy, not yet renamed Worthington because this is right at the time it's about ready to open and hasn't been renamed, at least for the newspaper's knowledge. Um, Conservatory of Music, Western Normal, which will become Western Military, and Lincoln Normal, which will become Cotner. And so all of those established, except for the university in the early 1870s, all the rest of them between 1887 and 1892 um, and before the big crash. Then they start going away. 1898, uh, Lincoln Normal burns down. Also in 1898, Worthington explodes. I like to think it was a gas explosion, except all the newspaper descriptions say they had their own electric plant. Um, the other version is that the powder magazine blew up. What they were doing with enough powder in the basement of a high school age military academy to blow up a huge stone building, but it did. Nobody was inside. They were all out on the parade grounds. The kind of explosion that I guess you have to pray for if you're going to... Scattered on that site today are still some carved stones of that building, but nothing reflecting its um, great mass and scale. So it's gone, 1898. Then we burn down in, 18, um, in, in 1908 and rebuild as the Berlinghoff version, Western Normal become Western Military, and then that becomes not an academic institution, but a, a correctional institution um, under state ownership. So we will take it um, off our list at the same time of the 1920s that we've closed the conservatory and they tear down the conservatory building. Um, I think it's 1923, so they're both gone. Cotner operates as a college to uh, 1933 um, and then in the depression closes as a college. Um, houses begin to be developed on the campus um, and then it is torn down in 1951. And then the university takes the, the lid off University Hall in the 20s, tears down the rest of the building 1948. And very last uh, of the missing old mains is Union College, where their old main, not the dorms, but the old main stood until 1975, leaving us Wesleyan and the true old main as the one and only um, on the Wesleyan campus. So that's my old, my eight old mains of Lincoln and environs. <laughs> Any questions that I can make up truthful or not truthful answers to? Or I've got Matt and Jim and Wayne and Kay Logan Peters here and we, we can cover just about anything. Uh, 14th of that Grand View portion, because the inner streets don't exist, uh, 14th was on the east, and I think it's 7th on the west. Duncan's uh, Superior on the south. Duncan's property is all west of it, but immediately west of the Grand View portion. Um, Hartley of, um, namesake of Hartley School, early superintendent of Lincoln Public Schools in the 1880s, had an orchard up that way as well. And a few buildings were built, a few houses were built up in Grandview. Uh, nothing really remaining other than 
some salvaged stones rebuilt into something else, um, but nothing of the early buildings up there. So Roxanne. The, were the colleges uh, money-making concerns? Were they, were they private colleges? I mean, <coughs> what motivated people to try and build so many? The question is, what, were, what was motivating the uh, building of all these colleges? Were they money-making concerns or private colleges? Why were so many built? The answer is yes, yes, and no, and yes. They wished, the colleges, I think, were, and particularly the denominational ones, uh, were educational ventures of those churches to, to have higher education within their, within their denomination, as Wesleyan succeeded at, and as Union College, of course, is, does as well. Um, and Cotner was to be that, and they graduated lots of ministers, um, of Christian Church from Cotner. They also were real estate ventures of the adjacent landowners who would give them a campus and often give them some house lots to sell at auction and try to, and they were to make money by not growing corn but as selling house lots. And Bethany was the example that the real estate developers were out ahead of the the college builders by at least a few years, and it was not as successful. Um, so they each were kind of that combination. When you read uh, in the Lincoln papers about can we get the Methodists to build here, they're all straight booster articles. They're saying um, someone with a Methodist Wesleyan in another state will write to Lincoln saying, we're making millions off this. They built a $100,000 building and their payroll is such and such and the spin-off effect of that. You want this college because it's, it, it's, your town will grow. And each of the smaller towns is trying to do the same. Uh, so they're kind of a combination. But they run into, almost all of them run into serious economic trouble, particularly in the economic setting of the 1890s. I don't know that anybody purposely lost their building, but several of them closed before before they burned down um, or before they uh, transitioned into another use. They were, I think, difficult to build, and so many of them in one community, and as Lincoln's population shrank. So uh, it, it was tough, uh, but they were meant to be permanent, growing concerns with a thriving town around them. And I think Wesleyan and Union College would be the ones that, that achieved that vision uh, most successfully, but with lots of struggle to get to those points. I think we've, we've now um, reached that moment. Uh, thank you for coming so I could look at faces and then we'll pretend I'm looking at faces on, on YouTube um, far into the future.